We are going to fly through the kingship of Saul in seven chapters. So please open your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 9. Grab a pen and a paper and please pray with me. Holy God, we love your faithfulness. We need your faithfulness and help us now to learn obedience through it. In your holy name, Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Well, my company was bought last year and like all transitions, it has been hard. People with long successful careers, but unknown by the new management or now for whatever reasons, way above my pay grade or either forced or encouraged to leave the company. And it's left many of us feeling on edge because most of us care very deeply about our customers and our company and our careers. And if it's ending, we want it to end well. We want our legacy at this company to be seen as untarnished by those who come after us. We started well, and whenever the end is, we want it to end well. And especially as believers working in the places God strategically put us to be a light to the world. In our marriages, in our parenting, in our school, in our workplace, in our ministry, wherever God has called us to live out this life, we want to faithfully fulfill the call God has called us to, right? Whatever it is, to give him glory with our lives. So Saul entered the service of God with so much going for him, but Saul was not committed to do what God asked to ensure Saul ended well. Saul started well, but he certainly did not end well. And the final statements about Saul should grip our heart. The Lord says he was grieved. He made Saul king over Israel. That struck me. Would the Lord say this about you and me as he looks at the privileged places he has put us to use our life for his glory? Where have we fallen short of faithful obedience to God? Would God be grieved that he puts you in the role that you are in at work, in leadership at work? Would he be grieved he mated you with the spouse he gave you? Would he be grieved he gave you the ministry or the children to lead? How have you responded to those places where God has put you? And where have you foregone being a humble servant instead of and instead becoming self-serving? Not a humble servant, but self-serving. This lesson teaches us God desires our faithful obedience. God desires our faithful obedience. Well, we love to learn in contrast, don't we? And last week we focused on Samuel's leadership, a prophet from God's grace. And now this week we move to Saul, a king in God's place. Saul stands in stark contrast to God exalting Samuel. We can already tell this is not going to go well. Three divisions help us see God's desire for faithful obedience. Our first division is Saul becomes king in chapters 9 through 11. And then our division two is Samuel's final words in chapter 12, and then Saul's attacks and rejection in chapters 13 to 15. So again, open your Bible for Samuel chapter 9. Well, Saul himself is this crazy complex soul. He's handsome, he's blessed, he's a competent leader, and yet he is highly irrational, inconsistent, and uncontrolled. Saul is out looking for his dad's lost donkeys, and you know what? He finds a kingdom. <laughs> Saul and his servants, uh, servants seek a nearby prophet to help find the donkeys. They stumble into the city, which in God's sovereignty just happens to be the place where Samuel is preaching, and they are told Samuel is making an evening sacrifice. In verse 14, as they enter the city, Samuel comes towards Saul. Now, Samuel had more in his mind than just the evening sacrifice and dinner with the people of Zuth. In 1 Samuel 15, we read, Now, the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel. About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him leader over my people Israel, and he will deliver my people from the hands of the Philistines. I have looked upon my people, for their cry has reached me. Now, this is interesting, of course, because Samuel knows the kingly tribe comes from the tribe of Judah. But Samuel obeys God. And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to Samuel, this is the man who will govern my people. Saul's obedient. But this word govern is a grave warning in the text. Saul's governing will not be a good situation for Israel. This will fulfill the prophecy God had warned the Israelites of, and we will see the people receive from the Lord what they asked for. A king like other nations, a king unlike God, a king like other nations. Saul's lack of knowledge of Samuel, the spiritual leader of all Israel, gives insight to Saul's spiritual state. 
Samuel invites Saul to dine with them and honors Saul as his special guest, and they even have a rooftop discussion deep into the night. It reminded me of a time I was in Las Vegas for a work conference. It was surreal at the check-in. Somehow I got upgraded to this beautiful, breathtaking three-room penthouse suite. It was odd since I had no intention of ever even wasting a quarter gambling, but I didn't want this gorgeous place to go to waste. And so I invited my friend up to the room and she was my colleague and we sat in the dark for hours looking out at the lights of Las Vegas and talking about life and talking about God until we realized the sun had started coming up and we had to quickly get ready for work the next morning. <laughs> well, back to Saul. So in chapter 10, verse one, I'm gonna read that to you along with the footnote at the bottom. So take a look at that. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him, saying, Has not the Lord anointed you leader over his inheritance, over his people Israel? You will reign over the Lord's people and save them from the power of their enemies round about. And this will be a sign to you that the Lord has anointed you leader over his inheritance. This is a pretty powerful proclamation, isn't it? But this is also the longest recorded speech to one individual in scripture, outside of a letter, of course. Uh, Samuel anoints Saul to be Israel's king and gives three signs to confirm God's appointment. Well, let's talk a minute about discerning God's appointment or God's will. Are you in a place of wondering what's next? What decision to make? How do you know God's will? Well, signs are really rarely, rarely a part of God's revealed will for you and me. And that's hard when we love experience and, and, and moments and, and things that we can feel and touch, but this is how God does reveal his will. It is through his written, written word, through your Bible. As you read and you study God's word, as you meditate on it and process it, as you experience God in conversation with God, he reveals his direction for us. So don't look for signs. Look to God revealed in God word. Our first truth, God speaks clearly when we speak, seek earnestly. God speaks clearly when we seek earnestly. In verse nine, as Saul turns to leave, God changed Saul's heart and all the signs were fulfilled that day. You can read more about that. But there's two strange events that follow. The first is Saul prophesies and then he has a conversation with his uncle. But characteristically fails to mention the vital information about God's appointment. In verse 17, Samuel summons the people at Mizpah. This is, this is intentional. It is not a happy place. It's not a happy memory. Do you remember what happened? Back in the days of the judges, the tribe of Benjamin was nearly destroyed in retaliation for the murder of a priest concubine. So at Mizpah, Samuel is making something very clear. He wants Israel to know this appointment of an earthly king is a rejection of their heavenly king who brought them deliverance. Samuel, or Saul, was the choice of a disobedient people, not the God of the people. So verse 20 is a veritable Miss America pageant and it gets down to the final contestant and where is the winner? <laughs> well, God has the answer. He says the one you people have selected as your leader is hiding in the dirty laundry. <sighs> Do you see the sad, sad picture here? God is their God, but they reject God. And yet, they still have to ask God to find their hiding chosen leader. So they drag Saul out and they say, long live the king. And Samuel then reminds the people of a king's duties. And then King Saul, he returns home to Gibeah with some supporters and some who grumbled and despised and, and talked about him. I'm just so glad our political landscape has advanced so far beyond this criticalness of our leaders. <laughs> so we must learn we have to be ready for God's surprising visits. Who would have guessed a donkey rescue mission would end up a God-appointed commission? Well, only God, of course. And this is how God works. Our life is in God's hand. At the right time, God reveals his will to us, and he asks for faithful obedience to his call. It's perfect. And it's perfectly puzzling, isn't it? 
Well, on we go. Saul gets on the job king training. In chapter 11, we actually see Saul at his very best. He rallies the people and he acts like a real king. The Ammonites besieged Jabeth Gilead and offered to spare the males if they would gouge out their right eye. Well, this had military significance because soldiers carried their shield in their left hand to cover their faces while their right eye remained exposed for being able to see. So losing their right eye rendered them useless in battle. Saul heard and he burned in anger and he cut oxen into pieces to rally and really force troops to join the rescue of Jabesh Gilead. Saul deployed his army and he slaughtered the Ammonites. And this victory elevated Saul's status. Some wanted revenge even on those who opposed Saul's kingship initially. And Saul shows great wisdom crediting the victory to the Lord. Saul had a first great first week on the job, didn't he? <laughs> and Samuel and Saul and all Israel worshiped God and celebrated their new king. Okay, so into our second division now is Samuel's final words in chapter 12. And in this moment in history, Samuel is answering a very big question of the people. Hey, Samuel, you say Saul is God's judgment on us, but Saul just rescued us big time. So we're confused by your guidance. And so Samuel reminds Israel of God's legacy of faithfulness as their deliverer and king from Moses to Aaron and down through Israel's history. But the people rejected God and, and demanded their own king. And so in chapter 12, verses 15 to 18, it says this, but if you do not obey the Lord and if you rebel against his commands, his hand will be against you as it was against your fathers. Now then stand still and see this great thing the Lord is about to do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest now? I will call upon the Lord to send thunder and rain and you will realize what an evil thing you did in asking in the eyes of the Lord when you asked for a king. And then Samuel called upon the Lord and that same day the Lord sent thunder and rain. And so all the people stood in awe of the Lord and of Samuel. So God is really putting the, his power before these people, isn't he, to say he is still with them, even though he is not pleased with them. And that's the kindness of God. He is faithful. And the people responded and they said, pray to the Lord your God. That's a sad telling statement, isn't it? It's not their God anymore. It's Samuel's God. But they understand they have added to all their other sins the evil of asking for a king. And so in verse 20, Samuel says, do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn away from the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn away after useless idols. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you because they are useless. Now, they are sorrowful and fearful, but at the end of the day, even after this warning from this great prophet and from, of course, God, they will serve idols. They will choose idols over God. God is absolutely all-knowing and all-loving, and this section showcases the absolute, unquestionable faithfulness of God. And that stands again in sharp, stark contrast with the unfaithfulness of God's people. <clears throat> God will never stop being faithful. God will never, never stop loving his people. So in 1 Samuel 22, for the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. We must know our unfaithfulness to God does not change God's absolute faithfulness to us. He cannot be unfaithful. That is his character. So first, uh, 20, verse 23, As for me, far be it for me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you, and I will teach you the way that is good and right. And But be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart, considering what great things he has done for you. These are tender words of a tender leader. Samuel is a leader to follow, and Samuel knows God's people flourish when they hold on to God. When they hold on to what God has said is good and right, and when holy fear of our holy God causes us to treasure God above everything else, he guides our ambitions. He guides our pursuits. When we treasure him above everything, everything else falls into place. So we learn here this truth is God is uncompromisingly faithful. God is uncompromisingly faithful. So what about when you're confused in the waiting and you're suffering in heartache and you're unsettled in your circumstances? 
Can you still trust God's faithfulness? And God says, yes. Open his word, lead into his truths. Consider what God has done for you by rescuing you for an eternity with him. Nike says, just do it. But God says, lean into me and I will do it for you. And I will show you how to do it the right way. So our third division is Saul's attacks and rejection, chapters 13 through 15. Well, the Philistines are a persistent threat to Israel, and as the Philistine army assembled, Saul's military quaked with fear and scattered, and Saul retreated to Gilgal to await Samuel's coming and discern God's plan. But Saul was impetuous, and he offered the sacrifices only the priests were authorized to offer. And Samuel the priest is horrified, and he says, What have you done? You have acted foolishly, and now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought another man after his own heart and appointed him leader because you have not kept the Lord's command. This is already a foreshadow of the necessity for a new and better king after God's heart. That will be King David, but of course that will be Jesus Christ, the king of all kings. But out to battle, Saul and his son Jonathan go, and we can't miss these contrasts set up in scripture for us. Jonathan is with his armor bearer, and he looks at the Philistines, and together they say, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving. Saul, his dad, the king, is reclining in the shade of a tree, consulting an excommunicated old pal of the cloth, Eli's great-grandson. Do you remember we talked about him a couple weeks, a couple of chapters back? He's seeking wisdom from God's rejected priest. And Jonathan says, God will make our next move clear. If the Philistines invite us up, the Lord has given them into the hands of Israel. And of course, this is exactly what happens. God makes his reveals his plan clearly. So God hears the panic. Saul, Saul hears the pa panic and he thinks the army is doomed and he calls in Ahijah to bring the ark. And again, he wants this divine protection that isn't God. And he sees, uh, go back and look at Samuel chapters four through eight. It talks of this danger. But Saul sent Ahijah and the ark away when he realized the battle was in Israel's favor. And in verse 23, it says, The Lord rescued Israel that day, as the Lord rescues Israel every, every, every day, as he does for you and me. So Saul imposes an erratic, senseless restriction on the soldiers eating. And Jonathan, however, was not aware, and he ate the honey, and his strength was restored. And when Jonathan was told of his dad's order for the worn-out soldiers not to eat, Jonathan pretty much rolled his eyes, thinking what a disaster he brings on his nation with his crazy decisions. But anyway, in verse 36, Saul devises a new plan to fight against the Philistines, and the priests suggest Saul inquire of the Lord, but God did not answer Saul that day, and Saul concludes sin was in the camp, and instead of looking at himself, he looks at his son, and he threatens Jonathan's life. But the soldiers step in, and they defend Jonathan. So we learn then Saul val fights valiantly against Israel's enemies, and all the days of Saul, there was bitter war with the Philistines. Okay, so first Samuel 15. Now we, we know Saul's, that Saul's right hand is Ahijah from the discredited house of Eli. And so Samuel comes back into the picture and he says, I am the prophet God used to anoint you. Don't listen to that other guy, listen to me. I have instructions from the Lord. And in a nutshell, it's destroy every Amalekite and everything belonging to them. And Saul is the instrument of promised judgment upon the Amalekites for their attack upon the people of God way back in the wilderness. You can read about that in Exodus 17. So God is fulfilling what he has said he would do. Paul sets an ambush, but Saul again, half-heartedly obeys God's instruction for war. He spared Agog, the Amalekite king, and everything that was good. And so in 1 Samuel 15, chapter 10, or chapter 15, verse 10, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, I am grieved that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and not carried out my instructions. Samuel was troubled, and he cried to the Lord all that night. God didn't make a mistake. Saul did. God is grieved over Saul's disobedience. Samuel learns Saul erected a monument in his own honor, and Saul boasts that he fully carried out the Lord's instructions, and Samuel calls Saul out, but Saul's lies only grow greater, because partial obedience is not obedience at all. Saul's heart is spiraling wickedness. 
Samuel can't bear to hear any more lies and delusion. And he says, stop talking, Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. God showed great kindness to you, Saul, but at every turn you respond in disobedience. And Saul twists around, but Samuel says in verse 22, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has rejected you as king. These are, again, some great prophetic warnings, but consequences clearly to disobedience of God. Disobedience brings consequence. And Saul is guilty of rebellion and arrogance and rejecting God's word. And Saul is only sorry that he got caught. And when we ask for forgiveness to avoid negative consequences or to, for personal gain, these reasons are just as sinful as the original sin we did before asking for forgiveness. There's no heart change. There's only genuine, only a genuine repentance with a heart change yields genuine forgiveness. And so Saul asks Samuel to come back with him, but in verse 26, Samuel says, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord and, is, and the Lord has rejected you over king, as king over Israel. Samuel turns to leave. And Saul reaches out and grabs the hem of Samuel's robe and tore it. And this is tragic symbolism. Judgment has come. Kingship will be torn from Saul. In verse 28, then Samuel says, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel for you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. That is the high view of God. That is a God who does not change his mind. He knows what is going to happen. Saul persists, and what we learn is Saul cares more for his position than to care to please God. And he wants God's pleasant presence and blessing, but he was unwilling to submit to God's instructions. And Saul wants the presence of the godly Samuel, but he's not wanting the presence of God who restricts twisted character. So do you profess to desire God, or do you want God on your own terms? Samuel refers returns to fulfill the duty the king was unwilling to do. God had said, kill King Agog, and so Samuel does in obedience to God. And then Samuel, with that job done, leaves and never sees Saul again, even though he mourned greatly for Saul. Now, we must not tolerate wrong, but we must grieve for the wrongdoer. Too often we identify a person in the wrong, but do we ask God to help us care uh, with compassion seeking to restore that person to God. And maybe on the other side, you feel the pain of, of disobedience. You know you have disobeyed God, but at the same time, you have been hurt by those seeking to help restore you to God. So will you seek forgiveness for yourself and will you extend forgiveness to others? When you believe God, you will not allow disobedience in your life. When you believe God and all he is, you will not allow disobedience in your life. And so, Here's what I hope you take. God loves you too much to allow you to continue in sin. God loves you too much to allow you to continue in sin. Will you please pray with me? God, we adore you. We need you. Please make these truths settle firmly into our hearts and minds so we think differently and obey you with fervency, guided and empowered by your Holy Spirit. In your name, Lord Jesus Christ, amen. God bless you.